Kenya is a country facing a water crisis. The country is home to over 50 million people and its population is growing rapidly. However, the amount of water available per person is decreasing as well. This is due to several factors including climate change, increased urbanization, deforestation and poor farming practices. A fortnight ago, I journeyed to the country's northeastern region to report on the problems the people face thanks to water shortage. To learn about the challenges the rivers up north are going through, and so the people are welcome you to this podcast. My name is Steve Mokai. I left Nairobi by road for Timau in Meru County, a water tower about to 20 kilometers northeast of Nairobi. After about 5 kilometers on the road, I arrived at Kisima village, the home of the source of River Timau on the eastern slopes of Mount Kenya. River Timau is a main tributary of River Ewasonyiro, the main river in northeastern Kenya. Timau is also the primary water source in the Meru and Laikipia counties. However, recently it has been at the center of controversy over fights for water. I met with Patrick Mutuma, the member for county assembly for Meru County. Mutuma, elected to represent the people of Kisima Ward, said water scarcity in the area has often led to inter-community conflicts between Meru and Laikipia counties. <laughs> is said that the residents of Laikipia County, which is downstream, constantly blame the Meru community upstream for most water obstruction. Last year, for example, he said, people from Laikipia County went uphill and destroyed water intake pumps so as to allow water to flow downstream. This source is the only source in the area in Mutarakwa, in the upper part of Meru, that is Bore, Napia Ndiyo sasa kuna kuwa na hile conflict. Ndiyo watu wa rikipi wanatoko kwa rikipi ya chini, wanapanda huku, wana destroy the index, ndiyo pia maji ya heze kutelemuka na afike huko chini. Mutuma said that in recent times, the conflicts have escalated to the point where the two communities organize themselves to defend the water from the other community, leading to fights. So, when I came here, I saw that it was very difficult. So, now the people are going to organize. They are going to find a way 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 to find a way. WWF Kenya, a private organization that promotes the protection and conservation of nature and biodiversity, that day also had a sensitization campaign for the people of the Ewaso Niro Basin. Dr. William Ojuang, the organization's freshwater thematic lead, while speaking to the community members at Kisima, asked them to take collective responsibility to protect water resources by jealously guarding the catchment areas. Journey of water. Catchment law. Journey of water. Catchment law. This is a campaign, a national campaign that is aimed at enhancing awareness on the need to secure our catchment, taking into consideration downstream communities, downstream biodiversity, downstream investments. The only way we can manage our water is to come together like this and understand that we don't have as much water. Demand is increasing. So we need to come together, have that understanding, and then share water. We are all Kenyans. Why are we fighting over water? Let us know how to manage our water resources. Meanwhile, Joyce Isiao, Dr. Ojuang's counterpart and the organization's head of partnerships, echoed the clarion call to take care of the water towers to protect the water available in the rivers. Isiao urged all the stakeholders to unite and preserve the available scarce water. If we do not take care of the catchment, then really that water will not, you will not open that water on your tap. Eh? And it is all of us who have got to do that, from government, private sector, and ourselves. Kenya is a water scarce country. What are you doing on your part to ensure that ethos does not dry? 
This is a national call to action. We must have a value chain approach where we are saying, please let's take care of our water resources. At the same time, Julius Kurinya, the chairman of the National Water Resource Users Association, commonly referred to as ROAS, said the destruction of water catchment areas had significantly contributed to a fall in the region's water volumes. He said destructive human activities such as cutting trees in catchment areas should be stopped. Maji, I talk about up. Maji, in a talk of Kashmir, Marit Matoka Kashmir, up in your Maji Natoka. So, from that point is where we should start protecting that catchment. Kenyans only to Napada Miti, Lakini, we don't grow them. Human activity. To Nakuja to Nakata Nini, you meet. Now, you just is the one which is now reading us. Kuaribu Kashmir is a zot, zot, Marit Makua. Your Kashmir should not be the way it is. Ngekua ni Kashmir and Bae, Ikondania Musito, Naikonaida to Naita vegetation cover. However, the MCA suggested the construction of a water dam to prevent future confrontations over water. He said the dam would preserve much of the rainwater that often essentially goes untapped. But I think he has a solution. Kipata ofadhiri wema na ofadhiri wengi watu jengea hata kama ni dam huku saidia juu wakati kuna nyesha sana tunaweza kuhifadhi maji so tunatumia ile dam na tunaachilia haya chemichemi ya atelemko kwa ekipia i think akutakuwa na conflict tena As we followed the river downstream on its sudden sojourn towards Samburu through Laikipia, a semi-arid land, I witnessed the river's water volume dip by and by. The further we went, the more it dawned on me that farming practices such as irrigation was a primary contributor to the reduction of the river's water. Ross Malenya, the assistant director of the Kenya Wildlife Service in Laikipia County said, the reduction in the river's water has a direct impact on the wild animals in the county. Besides the harsh effects of climate change, such as prolonged dry spells, Ross blamed the communities living along the Ewasonyiro North River for obstructing the river's flow thanks to poor irrigation methods. When you look at Ewaso River, the one that we are now walking through, the Ewaso Nyiro, the Ewaso Nyiro cuts across many counties and feeds a lot of wildlife. And if we can remember for the last drought that we've had, we've had a lot of elephants that have died, a lot of wildlife that have died because of the limited water that is left for them downstream. So we have a serious conflict with communities. Many people are doing irrigation farming. And this irrigation farming, some are doing the heavy, the, the traditional irrigation of flood irrigation where a lot of water is being taken out. We've also realized that we have a lot of vegetables along uh, the river where farmers are using agrochemicals. And these agrochemicals, as we, they go downstream, they have an effect on wildlife because now wildlife is taking water that is contaminated. Rose added that the acute water shortage in Laikipia County, which boasts several wildlife conservancies, has led to human wildlife conflicts. More so when we had the recent drought that has lasted for around three years, we've had an acute human-wildlife conflict because of competition for resources and specifically water. We have had homesteads where water tanks have been broken. We have had schools where water tanks have been broken. We have individual people who have uh, put their water dams and uh, wildlife go there to drink water, especially the elephants, which take a lot of water. So we have had conflicts and we've had to talk to communities to understand and allow uh, wildlife and allow the river to flow so that wildlife has access to water. She disclosed that the whole Kenya Wildlife Service was unsettled by the decreasing volume of water as River Nanyuki, on whose flows were the lives of elephants and other jungle inhabitants hinge. Looking at the water, you can see the color. Uh, the color is changing. Yesterday, when we started the journey, the water was very clear. The water was a lot. But as it comes, you see it is continuing to gain a lot of dirt, a lot of coloration, and even it's continued to decrease. Professor Japheth Onyando, a water engineering expert from Egerton University in Kenya, said the river's water could have decreased due to poor farming methods along the river banks that drove soil into the river, obstructing the natural flow. Upstream, you can have water, but as you go down, it dries up. Uh, you have pools and pools of water. 
because of the deposits of silt which uh, kind of impedes it or prevents it from flowing down. He said to save the endangered river, there was a need for the government and other stakeholders to educate the farmers along the river line on the proper farming methods that should be practiced. Intensify farm management practices and uh, let uh, soil and water conservation measures at farmland eh, be uh, enhanced. Ross said that the Kenya Wildlife Service had started a campaign to educate the public on the importance of sustainable water usage to both human beings and animals, both domesticated and wild. We want to ensure and to campaign that everybody utilizes water sustainably so that even the wild animals that we are, we are taking care of and conserving have water. After Laikipia, we travel further to Isiolo, where River Ewasonyiro ought to be flowing in its might and majesty, having garnered enough water volumes from its tributaries. But that was not the case. Its path was wide enough to fit a three-lane dual carriageway, but the water was not as much. Here, I met Alois Lerwara, a resident of Isiolo who was livid because of the river's small water volumes and the drought that had affected their animals and the people. Leluara blamed the situation on the over-abstraction of water upstream. The drought, he said, had left their animals without water and potentially rich fertile lands and productive and parched all year round. He said the dream of having a dam to regulate water availability and use it downstream the river has remained just that, a dream. There is a lot of water destruction from Ngarengiro, a bit of Isiolo. Now, we are not even complaining of Shaba, we are complaining of Merti, we are not even complaining of Shaba, we are complaining of Merti, Shafaka Farsa, not our interest. But in the Wasonyiro Development Authority, we are with that concept of having a mega dam. I thought that was the solution for pastoralists. Because Babu, they will be able to regulate. Now, we would have enough water, our livestock would have water but that has never been a reality. 10, 20 years down the line, to nine, but mega dam, mega dam, where is it? And when will it ever be? Lakini wakati watu wanaasa ku extract maji huko kufanyia like kipi alafu wana supply na makantas, nyanya, kitungu, as if we don't even have potential land in Maryland for barley or wheat. In addition, he said, the unchecked sand harvesting on River Iwasonyiro had dealt another blow to the remaining water in the river, lending it a deep brown color and lots of mud and sediments. These qualities, he said, make the water not very useful and even hinder the flow of the river as it flows downstream further. By sand harvesting, it is now becoming come a, an issue and by what wana kufa? Because Babu, people who are harvesting the gold from archers. Wanafanya usiku mzima. Hata wakati ya flash flood. Malori zinaenda. Lakini hakuna polisi. Watu wanajaribu kuongea. Watu wanajaribu kufanya nini. It's all landing on death here. However, it seems that the challenge of water scarcity is not a Kenyan problem, but a global one. Aware of the problem of water availability in the world, the National Geographic Society early this year launched the World Water Map, a geo-visualization tool of the world's water supply and demand, both on a global and local scale. The map developed by NatGeo in collaboration with the Netherlands Utrecht University professors identifies water scarce hotspots to help inform leaders and policymakers to take action and arrest further scarcity. Professor Nico Wanders, an expert in hydrological modeling, climate change, and physical geography from Utrecht University, explains how the map works. What the World Water Map is trying to show is uh, the water gap. And the water gap is basically the difference between how much water is naturally available and yeah. how much we as society, humans, and nature want to use. And that difference is actually quite big in some regions in the world, and we call those hotspots. And in those hotspots, what we're doing is depleting the natural water resources by abstracting more water than naturally is replenished by 
precipitation. Uh, and as such, potentially you see groundwater levels dropping, stream load levels dropping. The key thing about those hotspots is, is often it's you don't see it one year to the next year, but you do see it if you look over a long time. So it's a slow moving process, but it has big consequences. And, and that's what we try to visualize with the water map. He says the map will be vital in informing action to fix the water problem for sustainable posterity. If we know where the water gaps are, we can actually start working on removing them or solving them, looking for solutions. Most of those water gaps are slow moving phenomena. People are constantly abstracting a little bit more water than it's, than it's sustainable. So you don't see the impact from one day to the next, but it's something slow moving, just like climate change. That means that we need to make people aware and also policymakers and politicians aware this is happening in your region and we need to fix it or we need to fix it if we want to have a sustainable future. I don't want to see this as a, a disaster map. I want to see it as a map of opportunities. Yes, we need to be aware of it because most of that water is also underground, but we can also do something about it and that we can do with the storytellers and that we can do also by giving the data to scientists, which we do, that we make maps for policymakers. Professor Nico says wells and boreholes worldwide are the biggest culprits of over-abstraction of the groundwater, which is the world's leading freshwater reservoir. To stop the misuse of this water, he says, governments across the globe should be intentional in regulating boreholes. Any regulations regarding wells and boreholes? And I think that's the danger uh, straight away, because if you don't have regulations, everybody can make a borehole. That might be nice for you personally, that you have a borehole in your garden or your, your strip of land and are able to irrigate your field or drink from that. But what you take locally underneath your house also affects your neighbors because the water is flowing to your borehole from underneath their land. So what you see is that there's a competition underground for the, that, that groundwater resource. And with climate change and with increasing water demands, we actually see that fresh water, that underground fresh water, is a very reliable source. And thereby you need regulation from governments. And a lot of countries, even where I live, like the Netherlands, we have regulations, but we don't monitor. As the WWF Kenya team said in its public engagement forums, there is a pressing need for everyone to take action to protect water catchment areas, the water towers on land, and the reservoirs underground. Every drop counts now more than ever before. Many thanks for your time. I enjoyed your company. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>